Hi, today I'll be interviewing Rosie Ingebrigtsen, who's a clinical oncology social worker. She's joining us today to talk about support groups. When should you think about joining a support group? How do you find one? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of being in a support group? Welcome, Rosie. Sure, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So a cancer support group um, or a caregiver support group, family and friends support group is um, a group of folks impacted by cancer who come together to process, um, talk about their experiences, um, and just kind of get some of those feelings out and be with other people who really understand what they're going through. Um, they're a, an incredibly valuable resource for people impacted by cancer, whether you're the person diagnosed, if you're a long-term survivor, or um, a caregiver or loved one of someone who has cancer. Um, there's a lot of great benefits to going to a cancer support group. Some of them, um, there's a few different kinds of cancer support groups. Um, some are professionally facilitated. That's the kind that I personally have experience with and the type that I would usually uh, most often recommend. Um, others might be peer led, which can be really wonderful resources as well. Um, and then uh, you'll sometimes hear um, sort of more informal groups referred to as support groups. So something like um, a Facebook group, you might hear referred to as a cancer support group. But when I'm talking about support groups, I'm mostly talking about um, a group of people who are um, talking about their cancer experience facilitated by a clinical social worker or another mental health professional. Thanks so much for explaining the different types of support group. It sounds like it's really important not to assume everything is a support group and the distinction you've made is really important between a professional who's been trained who can help facilitate the discussion among people with common and unique experiences. So how do people go about finding support groups? What if you live in an area where there isn't one nearby or your doctor doesn't know how to answer the question, your medical team can't help you? So there's a number of different ways you can go about finding a cancer support group that's going to be the appropriate fit for you. Um, one is to talk to your oncology social worker if that's something you have access to. Um, not everyone knows that that's available to them in the cancer center, but in most cancer centers um, there will be someone like an oncology social worker or a navigator that can help you find resources like this. Um, so you can also talk to someone on your medical team, so a nurse, a doctor, a PA, an NP. Um, anyone on your medical team may have these resources for you. But if they don't, um, if you're not finding what you need by asking the people on your medical team, you can also look online. Um, I would always just suggest Googling cancer support groups plus your area um, and see if anything comes up. Things to look for when you are looking for um, search results would be, is this group professionally facilitated? Does it have a cost associated with it? Um, where does it meet and is it somewhere that you're comfortable? So is it, in, um, is it in the hospital? Are you comfortable going back to the hospital for something like that? Is it in a religious organization? Is that somewhere that you're comfortable meeting? Um, it may be in a community group um, or it may be at a community-based nonprofit. So there's lots of different um, places that may host support groups like this. Um, so, so asking those questions and looking online are two good ways to do it. Um, and then I would always recommend calling first too to just find out a little bit more um, about what the support group's all about so that you're not going to something um, and then finding that you're gonna be uh, uncomfortable there or that it's not the right fit for you. That is such a helpful answer. Thank you. It's, I learn something every time that we talk and I love the idea of doing the research online or asking the folks you're working with who are helping take care of you and then that call beforehand. What happens if somebody goes to a support group and it doesn't feel right? How, how, what should they just bail and give up on support groups? How, you know, how many support groups do you go to before you say this isn't going to work for me? So it, it, that's a really good question because it, people don't always immediately feel comfortable in a support group. And that can be for a number of different reasons. The first one that I think is probably most common is just that it's not necessarily the most comfortable situation off the bat to be seeking support um, you know, in a, any kind of context that um, you know, a lot of folks have never been to therapy before. They've never been to a support group before um, or worked with a mental health professional. Um, so it's not always a, a comfortable thing to just step foot in a room and you know, talk about your emotions and um, just sort of open up to a bunch of people you've never met. Um, so to a certain extent, I would say, a little bit of discomfort at the beginning is actually really normal and it's something that um, I think is worth trying to push through depending on the level of that discomfort, right? 
if you feel like, whoa, that is not for me, um, I think, you know, of course, you're not, you know, you didn't sign a contract, like you don't have to keep going. Um, but I think that's part of why I said call first. A lot of places, especially um, community organizations, um, like cancer support communities and Gilda's clubs, which are available in a lot of local communities across the US and parts of Canada, um, are likely to have someone do like an intake or an orientation meeting with you ahead of time. And the reason they do those meetings is to help suss out like, is this, is this group that we're putting you in gonna be the group that's gonna be comfortable for you? Um, so any of that kind of preparatory work that you can do to figure out whether it's gonna be a good fit is always a good idea, just so you don't end up somewhere that's uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, worth, it, it's, it's worth analyzing is this, is this just normal discomfort or is this really the wrong place for me? Um, and, and I think a lot of times it's the former and it just takes a little bit of getting used to. Thanks so much for that answer. That's really helpful to think about navigating that discomfort. I know a lot of my patients have felt very vulnerable in support groups. One of the things that I wonder if you could address is confidentiality. What if you go to a support group and there's somebody you know there? You know, how do our stories get held in a support group? What are members bound to do in terms of keeping those stories sacred, if you will? That's a really good question. Um, and you know, in my experience facilitating support groups, um, this has not been a problem most of the time. Um, people tend to be really respectful of confidentiality and privacy. Obviously it's tricky because in a group of people, you can't, you can't guarantee confidentiality. You just can't, um, but we can do our best. So that's one of many reasons to, to seek out a support group that's professionally facilitated when you can. Um, because you know, at the beginning, hopefully the facilitator will talk about confidentiality. They'll talk about, you know, I always say what's said in the room stays in the room. You know, remember that we're all protecting each other's privacy and that we're all sharing a lot of vulnerable stuff here. Um, so, you know, hopefully the facilitator will offer a reminder about that. The other thing is if there is someone you know in the group, if there are other group options, you may choose to opt into a different group. Um, if, you know, it depends on what the relationship is. So I have definitely run groups where it happens that two people know each other from the community and it's no big deal. They, you know, oh, hey, fancy seeing you here. You know, I wish we weren't maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's like two members of a family or people with a complicated past, I might recommend that those folks join two separate support groups just to avoid any kind of um, discomfort around that. But in terms of confidentiality and privacy, um, I think going in knowing that there's nothing that can really be done to absolutely guarantee it, but also um, you know, working with that facilitator, working with the other group members, and if you have a concern, vocalize it. You know, say there's something I want to share, but I'm I'm nervous because I don't know if you know if it might be shared in the community. I want this to stay really private. You can say that out loud and see what your reaction is to the group. See what level of trust you feel um, when you get their reactions to that question. So, anytime someone has a concern about what's going on in group, I always recommend bring it up in group. Um, the facilitator will help make sure that that's safe. And, um, and it gives the other group members a chance to really take ownership for what's going on. Um, and that just leads to a healthier supportive space. That's really important to highlight the importance of autonomy, that one has a choice whether to share one's story or not, and also the importance of trust, which we talk a lot about with one's clinicians. And it's the same in the community of support group networks, et cetera. So thanks for, for highlighting those different points. Next, I'd like to ask, are there certain times when people may find a support group's not good for them, or are there even certain types of people where they might get encouraged to go to a support group, but it's not really a good fit for them? In other words, are there downsides of joining a support group too soon? Is there such a thing as too late? Those types of things that you've learned over your years of experience as a leader and as a clinical oncology social worker. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's always worth exploring a support group, but you're right that there are gonna be times during the cancer experience and, and certain people who, for whom it's just not the right fit, and that's perfectly okay. Um, so you asked about too soon and too late, so let's start there. 
Um, you know, some people, I'll do an intake with someone who's like ready to join a support group the day they're diagnosed. And, and sometimes that works. For other people, you're so much in crisis mode and it, you're very self-focused for good reason. What's going on with you is a crisis. And so hearing about other people that soon might be just too much emotionally. It might be um, sort of more of a burden than a help. So for some folks, when you're in that crisis mode of like, I was just diagnosed and there is just so much going on with me that I can't necessarily tolerate hearing about other people's struggles, um, that's really a reasonable thing to say, to acknowledge out loud and to say, you know, maybe this will be for me once the dust settles, I'm into treatment and I know a little bit more about what to expect and um, what my emotional reactions are gonna be like. In terms of too late, um, you know, it's interesting. I see a lot of folks who come in to join a support group once they've already finished treatment because, you know, it, it's that same idea I was just talking about. While you're in treatment, you might just be kind of putting one foot in front of the other, getting to the next day and then the one after that. And then you get to the end of treatment, you're suddenly not as much in touch with your medical team. Um, and it can feel like kind of being left out in the cold a little bit, um, even though it's supposed to be this big time of celebration. Um, and so I do see folks when they're done with treatment and there are no evidence of disease that come in and say, okay, I actually need a support group now. And that's perfectly okay. Um, it, it, at my organization that I work for, we actually keep um, our living with cancer groups open to folks up to a year, maybe a year and a half out of active treatment. But I do think there, there comes a point um, when survivorship focused programs would be what's most appropriate. Um, because if you are, let's say two or three years out of treatment um, and you wanna join like a weekly living with cancer group, what it can do is actually kind of keep you in that cancer space and sort of restrict your ability to kind of move forward and, and move out of that cancer space. So each person is different. Like I said, some folks it's gonna be the minute you're diagnosed, you're totally appropriate for a support group. Others might not need one or want one until later on. Um, you know, even folks who are living with metastatic cancer, so they're living with cancer chronically, may choose to join a support group two or three years into treatment. Um, and that's perfectly appropriate too. Um, another, there's another few instances where a support group might not be appropriate. Um, one might be, if your mental health is really at front of mind um, to the point where you know maybe you are in treatment for anxiety, depression, or um, traumatic stress. Those are three really common diagnoses that can co-occur with cancer. Um, and if you need to focus on that, it might not be a good time to join a support group because um, you know hearing other people's stories can kind of bring up a lot of emotions. Um, so while you're sort of dysregulated, it might not be the right time to join a group. So in a case like that, I might say, let's get you into individual therapy first you know, get your treatment going for, you know, whatever mental illness you're dealing with, um, which is really common and normal. Um, but, you know, let, and then let's wait and put you in a support group once you're feeling just a little more stable and regulated. Um, other times might be, um, you know, if, it, it, let's say you're looking at a grief support group um, similar to cancer um, if somebody is uh, you know has had a loss really recently it might be too fresh um, same thing with like a diagnosis so a lot of it is just about talking to that clinician who runs the group if there is one um, and saying here's where I'm at do you think this is appropriate for me or do you think I should wait or look for a different resource Thanks so much, Rosie. Your experience is really valuable and I'm learning a lot again just listening to you. A lot of what you described is what I've seen with my patients. And the other final thing I wanted to ask you is about people who tend to take on other people's grief. That sort of over identification maybe, it's not too much empathy, but it's that leaving with everybody else's stories on their shoulders. And, and have you seen that in support groups? And what would you recommend for somebody who tends to tends to take other people's stories on as their own. So yeah, I have seen that in my groups before. Um, and, and I think it depends on the person. I know, I feel like I'm saying that a lot. It depends, it depends, right? But there, it's so much of this is individual. Um, you know, I think, I don't think that someone who is really empathetic and who takes on other people's pain is necessarily someone who shouldn't be in a support group at all. But I think it's someone who needs to go in knowing that about themselves and to have a lot of good sort of self-awareness and self-reflection um, so that that's something that they can maybe talk to the facilitator about. I know like ahead of time just to say, you know, this is something I tend to do. I really want to be in the support group because I want to be around people who get me, but I'm worried that I'm going to leave feeling all of this emotion, you know? So vocalizing that is so important. Um, and even vocalizing that with the whole group too is perfectly fine. Um, I think that 
you know, it can help to be an individual therapy as well. That's one thing, you know, having your, your resources outside of the support group in order is a really good idea. Um, and then also having a trained facilitator in the room who can say, you know, it, who can remind the group regularly of things like, I know it's so hard to hear about um, stories like this. And I just want to remind everyone that everybody's experience is different, you know, and then, and then doing some of that same self-talk as well. So when you're in that room and you are taking on that pain to remind yourself, okay, what this person is saying, it might make me feel vulnerable and it might hit really close to home, but it's not me, right? And so you may feel pain for that person, um, but trying not to sort of um, identify that too much with your own experience and to be able to separate that, a lot of it is just internal work. Um, and that's something that can be done in therapy, it can be done in um, working directly with the facilitator of the support group, and you can even talk about it out loud in group. And then I would say if you're someone who finds that when you leave group you feel worse, um, maybe a group isn't right for you. It's worth trying it a few times. I, I don't think that, you know, going to your first group, if you leave feeling a little shell-shocked, that's not unusual. Um, but if you've gone to the group, I usually recommend like maybe three or four times, and you find that you're leaving feeling like really drained and just kind of overburdened by the emotions that are being expressed, then, you know, it's perfectly okay to say, I'm going to wait until maybe I'm a, a little bit less um, permeable by all this stuff and and maybe I'll join a support group in six months or maybe it's just not for me and then you know you work with an individual therapist um, you do that work that you need to do and maybe you get to know people with cancer in say like a yoga or meditation class somewhere that's like a little bit less intense um, so support groups aren't for every single person I think they're worth checking out for every single person but that doesn't mean you're gonna land there necessarily and um, and that's perfectly okay too there's nothing wrong with you if it doesn't feel like the right thing Thanks so much, Rosie, for talking with us about support groups, how they work, how to find one, and what to expect during the support groups. If you like this video, click like and subscribe. And if you want to learn more about your treatment options, go to yerba.com to get your personalized report.